a series called There's Gotta Be More, and we've talked about all kinds of different things, and if you've missed the last couple weeks, I'd encourage you to check out our podcast. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, all that stuff. Um, anywhere you are, there we are. So uh, most of you have probably gotten a mailer from us, or you've seen a Facebook ad. Maybe it's a little bit creepy because we just keep popping up in your face. Um, you're welcome, you know. <laughs> We're just trying to help you out here. So we try to be where people are. We understand this is a society and a time, a culture where things need to be accessible. So we try to make sure that God's word is accessible to you uh, wherever you're at. So if you're jogging, you're on your way to work or whatever it is that you're doing, man, dial us in, listen to the messages. But we've been st- we started our whole series and we started this church so we're preaching Genesis 12, talking about the next step. And then we talked about what do we do in the waiting? That was the week after. Then the next week we talk about God, you know, what do we, how do we put what we love the most on the altar, and what does that look like when Abraham took Isaac, his son, and put him on the altar? And then this week, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different, still talking about this idea that there's got to be more to life, but this week we're talking about relationships. Still kind of pushing through Genesis, or in Genesis chapter 24, uh, we're going to be talking about singleness, dating, marriage, kind of all of it kind of lumped together. Um, but I thought before we jumped into it, I'd tell you one of my favorite stories of me and my wife. Um, so we've been married now for 15 years. Uh, I think I posted we had 17 Valentines together. Come on now. That's pretty awesome. A few of you are impressed. That's okay. Um, and so, yeah. And so that's, that's no small feat, man, uh, especially if you're married to me. And so, um, so we, we've been married a long time. But I remember when we got married um, in June uh, many years ago and we went on our honeymoon, went to Puerto Vallarta. And so we picked out this place. I'm probably not saying that right. Am I not, not saying it right? Help me out. Am I saying it right? No, not at all. Uh, he's been helping me back here with my Spanish a little bit, my friend from the Dominican. Um, and so uh, anyways, that place on the, on the west side of Mexico. And we were there and having a great time, did ATV rides to the rainforest and on the beach and all-inclusive resort. Like, and it was just amazing. And so we're on our way back one day from like a little excursion, and we stopped by this little ice cream shop. And as we stop at this ice cream shop, like, I get mine, she has hers, and we're walking down. Of course, I finish all mine pretty quick, because guys don't really know how to savor things like that. It's just like, it's hot, this is cold, you know. And so that's what I did. And so she had a little bit left of hers, like, hey, babe, can I try your ice cream? She said, sure. So she hands me your ice cream, and I blacked out. I don't know how it happened, but I finished it, all of it, what was left of her ice cream. <laughs> and it was an accident. I don't know how it really happened, but that's what happened. And... Um, Let's just say that didn't go over real well. Um, so we had, we had our very first fight on our honeymoon, and actually one of our only fights. Like, this was pretty intense. She gets mad. Have you ever seen when Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk? <laughs> that, that's kind of what happened there. It was like this instantaneous, you ate my dessert. And let me help you guys, those of you who are dating or those of you who are married, sharing is not sharing when it comes to desserts, all right? So when your wife says, hey, can I have a bite? It never means a bite. It always means, can I have all of it? So we've, we've come to this understanding early on, like if she says, hey, let's share dessert, I just say, do you want, your whole, do you want one? Because I'll, I'll buy two, because I know what that means. So sharing, guys, this is, this is free, it has nothing to do with the sermon today, but sharing is not 50-50, it's 98-2, all right? And so 98% her and 2% you, that's what sharing looks like. So we, this blew up. She stomps back to our, our hotel, and of course, I didn't know really even what I did. I mean, I knew what I did, but I didn't know how it happened like that. And so we made amends and, and kind of per- persevered through the ice cream fiasco. And if she ever has a chance to tell a story, she'll tell the story a little bit different, I promise. Um, but that's my version. That's how I saw it went down. And, you know, since that day, like, we've grown a lot together. We've had many different ups and downs, many different conversations, many different tense moments. Uh, but one of the cool things about marriage is that it's some, marriage and, and really love is something that you choose. And so that's kind of the, the, the title of today's uh, message is just love is a choice. Love is a choice. And we're going to look at Genesis 24, and I'm going to read a lot of scripture today. So I hope that's okay if I read some of God's word in God's house. So we're going to look at God's word in Genesis 24, and here's, here's the cool thing. I think there's times in our life, and it's not cool, but this is just a statement. I think there's times in our life where our relationships aren't what we hoped. Whether we're single and we wish we weren't, whether we're dating and maybe wish we were dating someone else, or whether we're married and it's just not what we dreamt it would be. And I think when we look at relationships, most of us can look in, and if you've been in a relationship or are in a relationship, there's ups and downs. There's good times and there's bads. And here's what I know is that love is a choice. And we're going to look at Genesis 24, look at the story of Isaac and Rebecca. And I think there's some stuff today that doesn't matter where you're at in your relationship journey, whether you're single, dating, married, looking, not looking, 
whatever you're at. I think there's some great stuff for you today in this. And so we're going to look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And it says this. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So at this time, Abraham, as we've been studying Abraham, man, he's acquired stuff. He's got land. He's got favor in, in the towns and the, the villages and the areas he's around, the country he's in. He's established money and wealth. And so Abraham's been doing great. So verse 2, it says, And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had been charged of all that he had, he says, Put your hand under my thigh. A little bit awkward. We'll keep going. Verse 3, That I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of the heaven, God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So he's asking, he asks, this is a way of doing an oath in the Old Testament. Put your hand under my thigh. It's almost like a pinky promise, although that would have been a better idea than, so if I ever need to make a promise to you, I'm all for the pinky promise, guys. Um, I'm not into this whole hand of the thigh thing, but that was, that's how they made an oath. That was like to seal the oath. And this is what he's asking him. Like, if, if I ask you to do this and your hand's under my thigh, you have to do what I'm asking you to do. So Abraham's putting a lot of importance into this, what he's saying right here. Like, what he's asking him to do is not a suggestion. It's not a good idea. It's not something he hopes he does. He's asking him do you guarantee, do you promise, with all that you have, do you promise to do what I'm about to ask you to do? So it's important, he says, the Lord of heaven, God of the earth, that you will not take a wife from the daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. And so verse 4 goes on, it says this, but we'll go to the country, go to my country, so where he came from, and to my kindred, and take a wife from my son Isaac. So this is really important because um, Isaac at this time, he's single, obviously. He's looking for a wife, and he's, he's single, ready to mingle. Isaac's 40 years old. So if you do the math of all that's happened, Isaac, is, he's, he's been living in the basement tent of his parents' tent for way too long. It's time for him to put down the Fortnite controller and go find a woman. And, and Abraham recognizes this. He says, I'm getting older. Like, I'm getting advanced in years. And in fact, Sarah, his wife, had just passed away. And so Abraham's, like, recognizing this. Like, if I don't maybe help this, if I don't get involved in this, like, this thing may never happen. And God promised, God made a promise all the way back in Genesis 12 to Abraham that I'm going to give you a son and I'm going to give you a great inheritance and I'm going to make a nation out of his offspring. Well, that can't happen unless the dude finds a wife. So Abraham, he goes to his most trusted advisor and says, hey, his most trusted servant says, hey, I need your help and this is what I want you to do. Ask him to go and ask him. But Abraham, this is what he recognizes. He recognizes that where they are and where they settled is not a place for him to find a wife. Abraham's in Canaan, and he's done well there, but as he looks around, he sees these, these people are worshiping all kinds of different gods. These people are living a lifestyle that's not approved by and not adhered by, not taught by the God and the, the, the beliefs that Abraham had. And he recognizes, if I leave, if I die, and my son's here, and he starts looking around for a wife, he'll probably find one. So I need to, to kind of position him to find a wife that's fitting for him, that's fitting for his beliefs. And here's kind of uh, another way to put this. Sorry, excuse me. Where you look for someone, where you look for someone matters because what they believe matters. So if you're dating, if you're single, this is important. Where you look for someone matters because what they believe matters, and their beliefs are shaped by their environments. So their friends, that matters. That's shaping their beliefs. Where they hang out on Friday night and Saturday night, that matters. In fact, where they hang out on Sunday morning, that matters too. Hopefully they're in a place like this. This is a great place to find someone, by the way. If you didn't notice that, look around the room. There's quite a few single people here today. That special someone might just be sitting across the room. Um, you're welcome. Uh, y'all ready for the altar call? Some of you guys are. Like, let's pray right now. Maybe God will bring them right now. Pray and believing in Jesus' name. Bring it in. Um, you know, so where you're looking matters. That, it matters. And so it matters where we look. We want to look for the right person in the right places because w w who we are is shaped by the environment that we're in. In fact, we know that 2 Corinthians talks a little bit about this. It says this, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So Abraham like understands this. Like I need to make sure my son is partnered with someone who has the same belief system. This matters to the inheritance, to the blessing, to the offspring, to the nation that God wants to build, that my son is matched with the right person. My son spends his life and builds his life and builds his family and builds this nation with the right special someone. So do not be equally, unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Okay. This term, unequally yoked, is not talking about eggs here. Um, it's talking about oxen. 
It's talking about in biblical times, they would take an, a, a yoke was a, a, like a piece of wood that have two big metal. And I tried to find one, uh, but no one uses those anymore. I could have won the Cracker Barrel, probably taken one off the wall, but I don't think they would like that. But uh, it's like a big piece of wood and have two big metal rings, U-shaped rings that the oxen's head would go in. And they would work in tandem together to plow the ground. So they had a mission, they had a goal, they had an objective, and they walked step in step together to accomplish something. Well, God understood something here. Abraham understood something here, and I think God wants to help you understand something here. It matters who you're attached to. Because if you're trying to go one way and they're trying to go another way, you're not going to plow the field. The, the goals that you have in your life, the dreams that you have, the potential that you want to see in your life, in your marriage, in your family, all those things are affected by the person that you attach your life to. That's why the scripture says don't be unequally yoked. You, you just, it ruins your potential. So if you have dreams, if you have desires, if you have goals one day to accomplish some great things, who you date matters. Who you marry matters. And so um, this, this is a big deal. And here's what we also know. This, this picture right here, do not be unequally yoked. This also paints a picture for us that relationships are hard work. Like when you yoke yourself to someone, it didn't say don't be unequally holding hands. <laughs> That's easy. That's fun. Grab the hand of that special someone. You're at that movie and the, dark, the lights get dark and you both have your arm on the armrest and you're kind of touching pinkies like, is that on purpose? Is that on accident? Do you guys remember those emotions? Those little moments. And if you don't, you'll get there. Um, and, you know, and you're like, was that on purpose? Is that on accident? Is she trying to touch my hand? Is she not trying to touch my hand? And then all of a sudden you're holding hands. Like, that's, that's fun. I'm just telling you guys, that's fun. And find you someone you can hold your hand with. I love my wife. love doing that with her. But this idea of unequal yoke, there's another picture being painted here. Not just that you can't accomplish the goal, but that's hard work. That relationships, when you make a commitment to someone, it's not always going to be sunshine and daisies. That there's some hard work attached to this and that the things that God wants to do through you, the person that's beside you or attached to you matters. And so great picture here. Now let's keep going. Let's keep going here in Genesis because we've got to get through much scriptures. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. So the servant's like, hey, I'm going to go to the land that you call me to go to. But what if she says no? What happens then? Must I then take your son back to this land which you came from? So I come back and get Isaac and be like, hey, she said no. She wants to see you. Like, your Facebook profile is not enough. Like, she needs to actually meet you, dude. Uh, you know, just that picture that she can see, that's not enough. Like, the stories that I've heard, it's not enough. I want to actually meet the dude. And so he says, can I bring Isaac? Abraham goes to him, no, see to it that you do not take my son back there. He says, verse 7, that the Lord, the God of the heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and spoke to me and swore to me, this is key right here, to your offspring I will give this land. So Abraham remembered the promise that God gave him. Abraham remembered, look at it this way, Abraham remembered the word that God spoke to him. So Abraham recognized right here that the word of God was directly attached to the will of God. That the word of God, catch this, was directly attached to the will of God. Where does Isaac need to be? Isaac needs to be here. Why? Because God promised him this place. But Isaac also doesn't need to be marrying someone around here. So what do we do? I'm sending this guy because Isaac's where he's supposed to be, and she's where she's supposed to be. I just got to put this thing together. The word of God and the will of God will always, the word of God will always show you to the will of God. So if you're looking for that special someone, a great place to start would be jumping in this book right here. God will reveal things to you. God will shape you. God will direct you. And he might just end up putting you in the path of that special someone. So uh, Abraham realizes this. He says, I, don't, I, don't, I know what the God said. God said, that I'm going to give inheritance here. So this is what he says. He says, God will probably send an angel before you. And you shall take a wife for my son there. Abraham has all the confidence in the world. You go do what I've asked you to do. You're going to find that woman. So verse 8. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine, only if you must not take my son back there. So he tells them, if you can't find her, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to hold you to it, but just do what I've asked you to do. So Abraham sends, sounds like, okay, so like he's going to, where's he going? Is he going to Newton, like from Wichita? Is he going to Kansas City? Like, where's he going? Abraham was sending his, his servant on a 400-mile trek on a camel. It took about four months to do that. So when his servant was saying, asking these questions, you may think, well, he's just not a very good servant. Like, you think that if he trusted Abraham, he'd just do this thing for him. He was ask, Abraham was asking him to give up almost an entire year of his life in pursuit that there might be a girl that they don't know in a family that they don't know that was willing to come back and marry a man that she doesn't know. <laughs> 
So you can understand why he's asking some questions here and asking like this, we got this oath thing going on. I got my hand under your thigh. This is a big ask. And all through Genesis, we see that this happens over and over again. That when we got to step out and do something that God's called us to do, oftentimes it's a big step. It takes a lot of faith. And so Abraham tells him, if you don't find her, I'm going to release you from that. But this guy goes, and he goes 400 miles, and he takes the trip, and he goes there. Because why? I think this is the reason he's willing to do this. Because he's seen God work in Abraham's life over and over and over again. He's seen God give Abraham a promise, and no one thought there was any way it could happen. And then all of a sudden it happens. So I think the servant was like, hey, if you say it, if you say God said it, I believe you. And that's important. So let's keep going here. It's scripture. Verse 9. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham's master, and he swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city, <clears throat> excuse me, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city wall. Sorry, I'm reading ahead on my Bible here. Forgot this. He made a hand, the camels nailed down outside the city wall by the well of the water and at the time of the evening, the time when the women would go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord God. So, so here's the servant. He's made the trek. He's there. He's at the place that God's called him to do. And the first thing, this, this is, I think this is huge for us. And the first thing that he does is he stops and he prays. And he says, O oh Lord God, my master Abraham, please grant me success today. And show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water. And the daughters of the men of the city, excuse me, the city are coming out to draw water. Verse 14. Let the young women to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. So he says this. The woman that I approach, when I see her getting water, if I walk up to her and I say, hey, give me a drink. And she says, not only will I give you a drink, but I'm going to water your camels. That's the woman. Let her be the one. So the servant proposes this prayer to God. He says, I'm looking for a needle in the haystack, God. You got to help me out here. But this, I'm going to put a test out there. I'm going to ask that when I ask this woman for water, not only she give me water, but she waters the camels. And I'll explain why it's important. Whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac, by this I shall know that you have shown your steadfast love to my master. So here's why that's important. The servant prayed, and I think that's key for any of us. If you're looking for someone if you're in the middle of a relationship, you're not sure what to do, I think a great thing to do is just to stop and pray. I mean, this guy was facing a, a, an opportunity, a moment where he didn't know what to do, didn't know exactly how it was going to work, and he went to God and says, God, I, I need your help, I need your direction in this. But before he finished, finished speaking, this is what's cool. So he stops and prays, and it says this. Pray. There you go. I gave you that. Verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, Behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Melchi. Melchi. So before he had finished speaking, so while he's praying, God sends Rebecca into the picture. The wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. Verse 16, the young woman was very attractive. This is good. Good for Isaac, right? You never know what the servant's going to find. You know, I don't know that too many people I would trust my buddy to find me a girl. You know, and so this is good. God's helping him out here. Attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. So this is now the servant's testing. He said, This is the prayer I prayed. I prayed when I asked this, she's going to have a specific response. And then verse 18, She said, Drink, my Lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So this is exactly what he had just been praying. He traveled for months. God had given him a word. God had given Abraham a word. He's stepping out on, on the faith of Abraham, doing what Abraham had asked him to do. He gets to town. He prays. Before he finished praying, Rebecca comes in, and then Rebecca does exactly what he just prayed. He says, I want, I'm going to stop. I'm going to give you a drink. And he says, I'll drink. I'll, I'll give water to your camels as well. And this is why it's important. A camel in those days, if he had walked any distance, could drink anywhere between 20 and 30 gallons of water a day. 20 and 30 gallons of water a day. Remember earlier in the story, he brought 10 camels with him. Let's say she's carrying a jug that holds 5 gallons of water. And let's say the camels are only going to drink 20 gallons. That's 40 trips of her carrying water back and forth to, to, to give water to the camels. 40 trips. 
You know what this tells me? This is a woman of class. Not only is she attractive, she understands God's appointed. She understands serving. She's there on purpose, for a purpose. She's not just there to just do her own thing and just meet her own needs. When, when, when this servant found her, he didn't just find a woman who was hot. He found a woman who was hot who had a heart for God. Because not just anyone was going to stop and water 10 camels for several hours. I imagine the camels weren't just standing there and she just moved water from here to here. It probably took her several hours to get it from the well to where they would drink. Back and forth, back and forth. And here's this servant standing by his camel going like, God did it again. Like, this is incredible. What woman would stop and do this? She doesn't even know me. And now she's, she's doing the exact, I just literally prayed this prayer and then now it's happening. Some of you guys, you've been waiting for that special someone for a long time. Maybe it's been a while since you prayed. Throw up some prayers, man. He's behind. And this servant prayed, and while he was still praying, that woman walked into the scene. So she's watering these camels, and she was caught doing the thing that made her significant. And so this is, this is I think this is key for us. Let's quickly empty the jar. Get right here. I think we need to focus on becoming and give the rest to God. What do I mean by that? Focus on becoming and give the rest to God. Becoming who God's called us to be. Let me, let me say it this way. When it comes to dating, I think this. This is, this is my thought here. Too many Christians are out looking and not becoming. They're out there and they're going like, who's out there, God? Who's, I'm looking for that special someone. I'm trying to, trying to find that special someone, looking for someone. I'm looking for that, the, the pretty girl or the, the, the nice guy, the sharp guy. I'm out there looking, I'm out there looking. But the problem is while we're out there looking, we can't be inside becoming. She was doing, she wasn't out looking for a husband, neither was Isaac out looking for a wife. What they were both doing is what God had called them to do. What they were both doing was being the, the, the person, the support that they were supposed to be in their family. She was caught serving, she was caught working, she was caught loving and being part of her family. She was caught in a, the place uh, uh, of God. She was caught in, a, in her family who was worshiping God. You know, I think for us, too many of us are out there looking and not becoming, and here's the danger in that. The danger in that is that you find who you are instead of who you hope to be. So if you're out there and you're looking around, the problem is you find out who you currently are. And you have this dream of this special someone. You have this dream that this is going to be perfect, they're going to love God, they're going to worship, they're going to serve, they're going to be great with kids, and all these things, these lists that we make of this special perfect someone, the problem is that someone's not going to be attracted to you because you're not that someone. So what happens when we're out there looking instead of becoming, then we end up finding who we currently are, and that's who we become yoked with, that's who we who we join together with, and maybe a couple years down the road, we try and look, and it's not quite like we thought. It's not quite how we hoped. And now we're in this struggle together because we jumped on this thing together when we quit, weren't, hadn't quite become who God had called us to become. So what do we need to be doing? We need to be caught becoming who God's called us to be. That's what she was. She was caught. She, she didn't go look. She wasn't out there searching. She was caught becoming the woman that God, in fact, I think this doesn't just apply to dating. I think this applies to marriage, too. I think if, if you're not careful, husbands, wives, if you're not careful, you can end up looking around instead of becoming the husband that you're supposed to be, instead of becoming the father you're supposed to be, instead of becoming the son of God that you're supposed to be. If you're not careful, you get caught looking around, then you end up being with someone you're not supposed to be with. And so we need to be focused on becoming who God's called us to be. Become a good father. Become a good mother. Become a good spouse. Become a good wife. Become a good husband. Become a person who loves God. Become a person who serves God. Become a person who studies God's word. And as we do that, here's what I think happens. that God brings both those things together. God aligns us. He helps us to become equally yoked. And you may be thinking, well, John, I'm married to someone that's not a believer. Here, here's why I say drag him. You got a yoke on, drag their butts to church. Come on now. Um, maybe they won't come to church, but you just keep pushing. You keep plowing. You keep leading the way. Don't give up. Don't, don't get weary in doing good is what the scripture tells us. So if you're out there alone and you feel like you're in your relationship and your husband or your, your wife is not carrying their part, you just dig deeper. You just dig those feet in the ground and you keep pushing that plow and you keep pursuing God and you keep becoming the person that God's called you to be. And here's what I know, just like in the story here, when we're becoming, God sins. When we're becoming, God sins. There's things in our life that I can't control. There's maybe people in your life that you can't control, but there's one thing you can, is your pursuits. It's your becoming. It's your pursuits. It's your loving God. You're serving. You're, you're investing into what you called to, are called to do. And this is what Rebecca's caught doing. She's caught becoming. So they invite the servant to stay the night and, and come in the house. And, 
there's a little bit more to the story. I'm kind of paraphrased here. And, the, and it says that her brother sees all these gifts. And he's like, hey, see all that stuff on this dude's camel? You need to come over and hang out with us, man. We, we want to know you a little bit. So they invite him in. He comes in, and they prepare this big feast, and they let him stay the night, and they prepare a feast. And, but the servant says this, before I can eat, I need to tell you something. I, I, I've got to tell you what's, why I'm here. I've got to tell you what's going on. So the servant goes all the way back to Genesis 12. And he says, there was a time when my servant, when my master, he lived here. He was from Mesopotamia. And God spoke to him that he was to go. And that if he would go, that, that God would bless him. That God would build a nation out of him. That God would give him influence. And God would bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. And he did. He took that step of faith and he went out there. And then it took years and he wanted a son and he knew he needed a son to accomplish the goals that God had given him. It took years and, and they just kept waiting. They kept praying. And one day they had a son and it was great and they celebrated for years. Then all of a sudden God asked him to give his son. Man, that was so hard. And I watched my master just step in line and just follow God. And he takes his son up the hill and he's getting ready to sacrifice his son just had God had asked. And then all of a sudden God stops him and says, there's a ram. I provided a sacrifice for you. And I've watched God over and over and over again do what he said he would do in my master's life. And then my master says, hey, I need you to go here, and I need you to find a wife. And so I come here, and I'm doing exactly as my master said. And he's doing exactly as God had said. And I pray a prayer, and I say, God, send the woman that would come through here. And when I ask her for a drink, she doesn't just give me a drink. She gives all these camels a drink. And that's what Rebecca did. So imagine the father and the family sitting around, even Rebecca, for the first time hearing all these things that God had done, all these things, this, this time that God had had his hand on this person's life over and over again. And, and now here's this great story, and then, but now here comes, the, here comes the punchline. We're not just here for water. I'm here for your daughter. And, and so she sits there, and the, and the family, the, it says the brother and the dad, they both say, hey, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. It doesn't matter whether I agree with it or disagree with it. If God said it, we fear God, and we need to do it. And so they say, yeah, let's do it. And so the next day they wake up, and they get cold feet. The family's like, well, what about in 10 days? Like, we'll send you, what if we send her out in a few days? We've got to get some stuff ready. Well, by this time, the servant, he's frustrated. He's like, man, I have rode four months to get here. I came here for her. I told you the story. You said yes. Get on the camel or don't. I'm leaving. <laughs> and so they said, well, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's ask Rebecca. So they didn't even talk to Rebecca yet. So they go and they ask Rebecca, and they say, hey, Rebecca, do you want to go with this man? And she says, I will go. And this is key. This is key for us. This is key for the story of Abraham because God just some years ago had asked Abraham to go and to trust him and to follow him and said, if you do, I've got something great in store. Now, here's Rebecca being asked the same question. If you go, I've got something great in store. You're going to get to be the mother of a nation. Like what God's going to do through you and Isaac is going to be incredible. We're going to form an entire race of people from your relationship. That sounds great, but it still took some, some faith to step out. And so they, so they, uh, as kind of as, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my notes here. I'm kind of skipping some stuff here. So in verse 62, kind of jumping a little bit ahead here, it says, Now Isaac had returned from, you, your guess is good as mine here. <laughs> Bear la la. Um, <laughs> Bear la huya rawi. Bear la huya. I think this is in tongues. I think that's what that is. <laughs> so anyone got an interpretation? All right, so Isaac had returned from this place here and was dwelling in the Negev. It says, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. So here's Isaac. He's got to be super anxious. I mean, imagine, you know, your dad sends one of his buddies out to find you a wife. That's not a, a real promising situation. It says he was, pro he was meditating, and I'm sure he was. I mean, if it were me, I would be out there praying. I'd be out there, dear God, dear God, dear God, this dude's old. Please help him find someone young. Like, <laughs> I don't want to marry my mom. You know, I, I want, you know, help him, God. Give him young eyes. Help him to know the things I need. And he's out there praying. He's out there meditating. So here's Isaac praying, walking, meditating. And this is, this is really good right here. You won't ever be right with your mate if you aren't right with your maker. And so Isaac knew, like, the most important thing for me to do right now, besides sit here anxiously, wait and look for her, is just to be right with God. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to talk with God. I'm going to pray with God. If I'm going to be right with my mate, if this girl comes and she's going to be the right one, and I hope she is, I hope she's beautiful, I hope this thing works out, but if that's going to work, I get better make sure I'm right with God first. 
See, this goes all the way back to that becoming. It's important for us as individuals, whether you're married or dating or single, it's important for us to keep first things first. And that is our relationship with God. That is us pursuing God. That is us loving God. That is us learning about God, studying his word, growing in him. If you're going to be right with her, he's going to have to be right with him first. And so here's Isaac pacing the fields. And then it says this, as Zoe. Uh, and Rebekah lifted up her eyes. She saw Isaac. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man? <laughs> I'm adding a little emphasis there. It's not quite there. But, but you don't get off your camel if you don't. Like, she's probably, it's not the first person she's seen as she's been on the four-month hike back to where they're from. But all of a sudden, she recognizes something. Maybe God had like a shimmering light, like a little ray of light through the clouds. And it hit Isaac perfectly as he... You know, threw back his locks. <laughs> you know, probably did one of these with his beard, you know. And she's like, who is that man in the field? She recognized him. I, I have to say, it probably had something to do with the fact that he was walking with God. Maybe a little something happened in there. And he was walking in the field to meet us. So here's Isaac. He's pursuing her. Man, this is good. Pursue your wives. Dudes, open doors. Treat them well. Do this. So here's Isaac. He's, he's pursuing her. And the servant said, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. So she took her veil and she covered herself. This is free here. But back in, in, in biblical times, they would keep their faces guarded until they were married. They kept things covered. They kept things. So just because you like them or just because they do something nice for you doesn't mean you got to start taking stuff off. I'm just saying. That's free. Um, no one shout me out down there. So she, she kept like security intact. She didn't say, well, we're getting married anyways. I already made a commitment. Like, come here, buddy. You know, like it was nothing like that. She took her veil. She covered herself. And she started walking towards him. And it says, the servant told Isaac. The servant told Isaac all the things that had happened, all the things that he had done. And I'm sure Isaac's like, how does God keep doing this? Like I've seen and I've heard these stories from my dad. And I've seen these things happen. And now it's starting to happen in my own life. And so it goes on to verse, oops, sorry, 66. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And he loved her. He's known her for, what, 10 minutes? Saw her coming in off the field, brought her in there, became his wife, and he loved her. How do you love someone you've only just met? How many of you guys seen Frozen? The first one, Frozen 1. So you remember the scene when Anna is in the, in the sleigh with Kristoff? And she's like, I'm in love, and I'm engaged. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, that's great. You know, how, you know how, how do you know him? And she's like, well, I've only known him for a day. You know, and he's like, how do you know that you love him? And he goes, what color is his eyes? She goes, dreamy. You know, what's his last name of the Southern Isles? You know, you know what I'm talking about. And so she's, she's engaged to this guy she's only met for a day. And so Christoph is like, this isn't right. This isn't love. And he goes, what happens if he picks his nose? She goes, he does not, and eats it, you know. <laughs> she's like, he's a prince. He doesn't do that. You know, but it's this whole idea that love can't happen overnight. You can't fall in love with someone in 24 hours. Christoph is like, I know a thing or two. I know the trolls, and they taught me about love, you know, and this isn't how that works. But that's not what we see here. Isaac's known this woman for just a short amount of time, and it says, and he loved her. How is this possible? Love is a choice. No long conversations, no months of dating, just the promise of God and a choice. Whether you're single, dating, or marriage, this is true. Married, this is true. If you can fall in love, I've heard this said, if you can fall in love, you can fall out of love. So if what draws you to that person is just you're attracted, that you're attracted to them, guess what? One day they're going to pack on a little bit of weight. Sorry, honey. Um, you know, and one day they're going to not be as fast or as tall or as good looking or have as much hair as they used to. One day they're going to be tired and they're not going to feel like doing the extra stuff they used to do with you as often as they used to do it. I'm talking code here. we got some kids. You know, things change and, and things shift and, and things shift. And so, well, what happens when that happens? Do we just say, well, hey, I'm on to the next best, better thing? Do I start looking for what was? Do I start looking for what I used to have and for someone else? Do I start talking to someone else? Do I friend that Girl I used to date in high school on Facebook, do I, what do I do when things start to shift? Well, if love is only an attraction, if love is only an exchange, then it's real easy to bail out on love. But when love is a choice, 
When you say, till death do us part, or as it says in the New Testament, let no man tear asunder. When, when I've made a, a covenant, you see, here's the difference between a covenant and a commitment. I think a lot of people make commitments when they get married. A commitment says low risk, low responsibilities. I get something out of this, right? I'm making a commitment, and like when you go to like rent a piece of property, like we go to rent this, I'm looking for a commitment that benefits me. That, that when I sign the papers, like I hope I get something out of this too. But a covenant's not like that. Covenant says, this is what a covenant says. It says, high responsibility, high sacrifice. And so the difference in, in, in love is a choice or love is a feeling is that it says, whether you have something to offer me back or not, I choose to love you. And in fact, Paul talked about this, says love, that the, that the, that the bride, that the, the husband is supposed to love the wife like Jesus loves the bride. Well, what did Jesus do for his church? He died on the cross. Can you halfway die on a cross? And what did we do in return? What did, he, what did he have to have in return from us for him to do that for us? Romans tells us that while we're still yet sinners, he died on the cross. So what that tells us is we didn't have to do anything to get that from him. And that's what Paul tells us. That's what the picture of marriage is supposed to be. It's 100%, 0%. And that's a picture of dating. That's what a good relationship should look like, is that I'm willing to give you everything that I have in return for nothing. Why? Because I choose to love you. You see, I think when, when love is a feeling and you're looking for all these tingly things, and, and I think you should make lists, and I think you should know what God's word says about what a spouse looks like and what marriage looks like. But when it's hinged on just a lot of feelings, it's real easy to abandon. But when love is a choice, when Isaac says he loved her from that day one, that was a choice he made for the rest of his life. And so today, I just want to challenge you guys, whether you're dating, whether you're single, whether you're married, is to choose love. To choose love, whether that's with someone you're dating, someone that's significant, or it's just someone you're next to. Is that, that's what should be separating us from the rest of society. In fact, Jesus tells us, said, the thing that should separate you from ever, for the rest of the world is that you would love your brother. That you would love other people. And uh, Paul talks about that we would love someone so much that we lay down our life for our brother. That's 100%, 0%. And so I think for us to heal our marriages, for us to heal our relationships, we've got to change our perspective of what a good marriage looks like, what good dating relationship looks like. And that's 100%, 0%. <laughs> God, we love you. We thank you, God, that you love us so much. God, that you sent your son for us. God, you showed us what love is. You showed us that love is a choice, God, because we know when we study your word and when we, when we see the story, God, that there's so many people who've done good things and done bad things. God, when I look at myself in the mirror, I can see someone who doesn't deserve what you've given me, yet you still gave it to me. God, and so for that, we say thank you this morning. God, I pray that that picture of love, that picture that love is a choice, God, that we would be able to, to embrace that, God, that we'd be able to embody that and we'd be able to give that to our spouse. God, that we'd be able to give that to the people that you've called us to, God, whether that's friends or our neighbors. God, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, God, and that we would love you also. God, help us to embody this idea that love is a choice, God. It may not always feel good. It may not always look good. But today I choose to love you, and today I choose to love my wife. And God, I know in a room that's this size, there's so many people coming from so many different places. Some people are single and looking. Some people are single and broken. Maybe they're done looking. They've been there, they've done that broken relationship or a broken marriage. I know there's some people that are maybe rebounding. They've had brokenness, but they're still looking and still hopeful that there should be someone else coming to life. Maybe there's some people in the room that their marriage is just barely holding on by a thread. Maybe there's some people in the room that their marriage is great. I know in a room like this, it is so various. But here's also what I know is that you love each of us and you're calling each of us to love you. God, help us to focus today on becoming who you've called us to be. And God, I pray that as we do that, God, that your word would ring true. And God, that you would help us to grow in right relationships with each other. God, I pray that you'd help us today to become the person, God, to, to become the person you call us to, to be. God, to love you. God, to put you first. Matthew 6 says this, seek you first, and then all these things will be added. God, so today we, we choose to seek you first, no matter where you're coming from, no matter where we're at, God, no matter whether we're broken or hurting, no matter whether we've been abused or whatever, no matter how we approach the throne today, God, here's the choice that we make together is that we're going to seek you first in Jesus' name.